if I could sort of put you in the time machine to go back to Queens for a moment, I'd love to sure. maybe start back there. Yeah. Um, so really general, um, can you help me understand and, and can you set up your grandmother and your grandfather? What, what were they like? Um, if you could describe sort of their, their outlook on life. I'd love your, your take on that. In, in some ways, they were um, very traditional Americans in their position and in their time. Um, you know, my, my grandmother was an immigrant from Scotland. My grandfather was a first generation American. Both of his parents were from Germany. He grew up speaking German. And yet, the goal was to assimilate. So uh, they, they retained very little of the cultures they hailed from. And, uh, you know, my grandmother actually also grew up speaking Gaelic. Um, but none of, none of their children learned either of uh, the, the languages they, their parents grew up speaking. They were also quite traditional in terms of gen, uh, gender roles. Um, but it was even more extreme in my family than I think it typically was. So, for example, you know, my grandfather was the breadwinner and my grandmother ran the household. But my grandfather was in charge of everything. But it also, there was this real sense that the girls were of no interest to him and my grandmother had little to nothing to do with the boys. Um, and, and that, like, that was a pretty extreme uh, way to approach child rearing. And I, I think you could see it in, in the way her relationship with her sons played out over time. Yeah, it, it sort of brings me to a question I have, which is that um, at least with, with your Uncle Donald, that there was a distance between Mary and him. Can you help me understand that? Yeah, it started very early in his life. Uh, when he was two and a half, uh, my grandmother uh, got very ill. Um, she was found passed out in the, in the bathroom and she was bleeding profusely. And after they rushed her to the hospital, they realized that she had had some undiagnosed postpartum uh, issues from uh, the birth of my Uncle Rob nine months earlier. And for about a year, she was in that hospital. At first, they didn't think she was going to survive at all. So essentially, for that period of time, Donald, who was at a very, very critical point in his development as a child, was essentially abandoned by her. It Obviously, it wasn't her fault, but he, ex uh, she was his only real human connection. You know, she was his primary caregiver, the main source of love and affection and soothing. And uh, he was suddenly without her. My grandfather was certainly incapable of filling the void. And not only did he not fill the void, he was a very, uh, he was very impatient with children. He had no use for them. So uh, Donald probably experienced my grandfather's failures to step up um, as something to be afraid of, you know, like wanting something, um, needing something that my grandfather was either unwilling or able to provide for you, um, would basically be met with, uh, derision <laughs> by my grandfather. So that was bad enough. When my grandmother got better to the extent that she did, for reasons I don't completely understand, and it may simply be because of that divide, that gender divide in the family, it may be because she didn't really recover as well as people might have thought. Uh, you know, there were certainly um, physical issues that she continued to have, osteoporosis, et cetera. But I think there was a real psych a psychological um, amount of damage uh, that she suffered um, that so for those reasons, she just wasn't able to heal the rifts that had occurred between her and Donald. And, you know, he never trusted her quite. And I think the final betrayal was when at the age of 13, um, they wanted to send him away to the military academy, uh, which, you know, my aunts referred to as a reform school. And my grandmother did absolutely nothing to prevent that from happening. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I hadn't heard that before, um, that he resented her for not sort of protecting him from, from being sent off. Yeah, and, uh, you know, obviously I wasn't there, but um, when I was old enough to notice th these things, 
Um, there was a, a distance between all of her sons and my grand grandmother. There was a sort of uh, condescension and infantilization. And I think part of that was the times, you know, the 50s, 60s. Uh, part of it was that she responded well to that sort of thing. But it, to me, it spoke to um, a distance in their relationship and, um, you know, the fact that they didn't particularly respect her um, and that there, there wasn't a closeness between them. I, you know, I, I don't believe any of her sons ever confided in her or ever went to her if they needed help with anything. I've noticed that, that your uncle doesn't keep a photo of his mom, you know, in the oval, in, in the way in, uh, that he sort of, you know, certainly does with your grandfather. Yeah, when um, we were at the White House in April of 2017 for my aunt's birthday party, uh, we were in the Oval Office and Donald said, and the only thing behind the desk, that I, the only photograph behind the desk, there might have been some challenge coins or something, was this old picture of my grandfather that used to be in the library of my grandparents' house. And Donald said, hey, look at this picture of dad, isn't that great? And we'd seen it like a million times. So yeah, it's great, Donald. And Marianne says, with her very dry delivery, um, maybe you should have a picture of mom. Uh, and he's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Somebody get me a picture of mom. So clearly he didn't have one, <laughs> you know? So. Um, there actually is now a picture of my grandmother, but it's a really old one. How do you think his relationship with her impacts the relationships he goes on to have with women? Well, uh, some of it is the relationship he had with her and some of it is the, the misogyny in the family. Um, so I think that because of his relationship with her, he may not entirely trust women. Uh, he finds it in difficult, if not impossible, to uh, connect with them on any deep level because I don't believe he ever was able to with her, at least, you know, after he was two and a half. So he has a way now of um, objectifying women. And I, I again, I, I don't know that he has ever had a deep, uh, meaningful, romantic or intellectual uh, connection with uh, a woman. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask you a little bit later about uh, about more of that. But let's switch to your grandfather for for just a moment. I mean, what you've sure. described though is a, a pretty rigid guy, um, yeah. a rigid figure, and and certainly in his children's life is a guy who's got an outlook that he's trying to instill in them, which is there are winners, there are losers, there are killers. Um, right. Can you give me sort of the the school of you know Fred Trump <laughs> sort of summary? Yeah, you sure? <laughs> um, yeah, it's not very fun. Although, honestly, if you if you met my grandfather, he was quite a cheerful person. Um, you know, he wasn't this grim, uh, dark figure lurking around. Um, he seemed fairly lighthearted, but he was in control of everything. So you know that helps, I guess. But there were there were two main outlooks that he had that determined how his children were going to do, well, I guess his sons uh, mostly, and certainly mostly my dad and, and Donald. Um, the first was, as you said, winners, losers. Life is a zero sum game. There's one winner, everybody else is a loser. If you're not winning, you're losing. Unfortunately, he didn't just have that philosophy in the context of his business. He, tr he ran his family that way. Uh, and Donald learned early on, in part because my grandfather was um, not simple-minded exactly, but he just hit on the same things over and over again. So it was very difficult to avoid getting his message. But also Donald had the benefit of being seven and a half years younger than my dad. So he was able to watch what my grandfather considered the mistakes that my dad made and Donald, in part because he was uh, characterologically suited to being my grandfather's son, but also because he wanted to avoid my father's fate of, you know, abuse and humiliation at the hands of his father, he he took that lesson to heart and became um, and did everything in his power to become the killer, the tough guy, 
the person who would do anything in his power to be the winner, uh, the person who would never be wrong, could never be wrong, could never admit a mistake, and avoided being kind because all of those things in my grandfather's universe spoke to um, in an unforgivable weakness. The second, um, and, and in some ways maybe even more debilitating philosophy my grandfather had was the power of positive thinking, um, which he did, I don't think he learned it from Norman Vincent Peale who wrote that awful book, but um, it, it perfectly fit in w with what my grandfather already thought, right? Everything's great, you know, and if you think that way, then everything will be great. The problem is everything is not always great. Hum most human beings have a fairly wide range of emotions and experiences. So it's very dangerous when the person who's essentially in control of your life disallows any feelings he either doesn't value or that make him uncomfortable. For example, my grandmother, as I mentioned, had osteoporosis, was frequently in the hospital with broken bones and would be brought home for, to do rehab and she'd be in a hospital bed in, in the library in pain. And my grandfather would come in the room and he'd say, everything's great, right, Tuts? And it wasn't a question, it was sort of a command. And no matter what, she would just grit her teeth blink back her tears and say, yes, Fred, <laughs> you know, even though nothing was great. So what he ended up, what my grandfather ended up doing is making it impossible to um, experience or at least al allow yourself to feel certain things uh, to, you know, ever to be sad or depressed or less than perfect. And the reason I think that that might actually have more of an impact on what's happening to us now is because we see how that continues to inform Donald's way of approaching the world. You know, everything's great, he's always right, um, nothing's ever bad, and it's this toxic positivity that um, completely elides this entire realm of human experience and emotion, but that also um, puts up a barrier to facing things that need to be faced if they are counter to his preferred narrative. You couldn't possibly be talking about COVID and- uh, What and makes you think that? <laughs> And bad news, you know, but it, it is certainly a, a line that we draw from Norman Vincent Peale and um, the yeah. idea of imagine the world you want, the problems um, that you uh, anyway can cast away. Um, it's fascinating to hear you say, though, that it's it's really sort of something he's adopting from from dad. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, you know, when I started working on the book, one of the things that most fascinated me was all of the through lines that run from my grandparents' house to the Oval Office, uninterrupted. You know, it's, it's quite incredible and a little unnerving, I have to say. Um, but yeah, we, that's, we find ourselves in the situation we're in right now because when COVID first was recognized as being a potential threat, um, that could not be acknowledged because it was bad. It was a bad thing and you don't wanna spook the stock market. So of course we did not, he did nothing and it became more and more of an issue that had to be addressed, but to address it properly would mean acknowledging a mistake had been made, like course correcting would have been admitting that he'd been wrong from the very beginning. So what happens? We deny it. It's going to disappear. It's not that big a deal. You don't have to wear a mask. So at a time when he could so easily have been a hero to people who already despised him, right? By getting a hold of this, getting ahead of it, he's continuing uh, to say, it's under control, it's going away, it's gonna be fine. Um, and if he's shifting his tone a little bit, it's simply because um, 
if that's what he needs to do to get reelected, that's what he's going to do. It doesn't mean that he has any deep convictions about it one way or the other. Let me ask you really briefly, did you ever go to church? Did you go to the Marble Collegiate with them? Uh, do you have any memories of that? Yeah. Um, you know, church was not something we did frequently. Uh, it was more of like an occasion thing, you know, weddings. I think everybody... I think everybody except my parents was married at, at Marble Collegiate Church. Other than that, though, I, um, you know, we, we weren't churchgoers. They weren't churchgoers. Let me go back to sort of the time machine for a moment. So um, mm -hmm. you, you were describing, though, some of these kinder, empathetic traits that your dad had that were sort of declared as weaknesses by, by his father. And I wonder if you can sort of help me around this time period understand where your dad and Donald sort of fell in the pecking order of the of the family, because, you know, early on, Donald is not the favorite son. You're, you know, your dad is early. Can you mm -hmm. help me sort of understand um, how that shift sort of begins to happen, but but early, what Donald yeah. is also seeing in, in your dad? My dad was the favorite initially simply because he was the first. He was the namesake and the heir apparent. Right. So in a really weird way, despite the fact that my grandfather had no use for children in general, he had a use for my father. So my dad early on was protected in a way Donald wasn't um, because he mattered to my grandfather, uh, you know, as an extension of his ambitions. As my father grew older and his personality became clear, you know, came into focus that uh, he was sensitive, he was kind and generous, he liked hanging out with his friends who adored him, and maybe worst of all, although it's hard to say, he had interest outside of the family business. Like this is a guy who, you know, liked to go to parties and he liked to fly and he liked to be on boats and go water skiing and fishing. My grandfather understood none of that. Um, so, it, I mean, it probably wasn't until Donald was in high school that my grandfather started turning his attention away from my dad to Donald. I mean, the, the plan was still for my father to work for Trump management out of college and, you know, be the right hand man. Um, but my, my grandfather already had his suspicions that it might not work out. I don't believe he ever really liked my dad. Um, and it became clear fairly quickly that he didn't respect him. What's very interesting about how that shift occurred uh, with, between my dad and Donald is that the, the ways in which Donald suffered as a very young child, the ways in which my grandfather ignored him, um, wasn't there for him, um, made him feel lonely and afraid, led to uh, these defense mechanisms that Donald had to develop in order to protect himself from that loneliness and fear, right? Which then made him the kind of person my grandfather could make use of. You know, a bully, uh, somebody who was completely indifferent to what um, other people thought about him. That's not true anymore, actually, but it was true back then. Uh, somebody who was willing to do whatever it took to be the best. Um, and, you know, Donald also took it a step further, also probably out of fear. He um, became, he wasn't just better than everybody, he was the best. He was always winning. And then he was um, much better, my grandfather, at, you know, manipul ma manipulating the media over t eventually, you know, um, and presenting himself with this hyperbolic self-regard that um, even my grandfather couldn't have imagined. Let me ask you about the transformation that happens um, at New York Military Academy and the decision to send him away. Was that, do you think it, your grandfather was um, trying to clean him up, was trying to prepare Donald, uh, was trying to straighten him out um, to take on this, this role of being your parent? No. It, it, no. What, okay. Tell me your, your, your theory on New York Military Academy, why he goes. Well, I, I think it was just a nuisance for my grandfather. You know, um, he was on the board at the school Donald attended in Forest Hills. Uh, 
and uh, Donald was getting into trouble all the time. His behavior was escalating. It went from just, you know, bullying, like name calling to physical confrontations. And, you know, it was, uh, I don't know if embarrassing is the right word because I don't think my grandfather was capable of embarrassment, but it was, it was an inconvenience um, that he probably didn't want to deal with. So when the idea of New York Military Academy was, uh, was raised, he was probably like, fine. Because, you know, it's not like he was, he wasn't home that much. So my, my grandmother certainly got more of the brunt of Donald's misbehavior in the house. But um, I think initially it's just my grandfather was, didn't care. You know, if it's, this is, if this is causing problems, then fine, go send him away. It wasn't about straightening him out or um, toughening him up. You know, he was already pretty, um, at least it, as my grandfather saw it, he was already tough in the way my grandfather uh, wanted him to be. He does visit him, though, quite frequently. What do you think that's about? You know, I've thought about that um, because my my grandfather lost his father at a... He was the same age when he lost his father that Donald was when he got sent away to school. So I've wondered, even though it, it seems counterintuitive given uh, the kind of person my grandfather was, but I've wondered if maybe he felt some kind of, um, not sympathy exactly, but uh, he identified maybe in some way with how Donald probably felt, you know, cast off. Um, but over time, I think it's because they started developing a real rapport and understanding. And my grandfather finally started to see in him the son he wanted. What made your dad, do you think, reject the family business? My grandfather didn't give him a choice. Um, you know, I hear people say that my dad didn't want to do it. Um, I've heard Donald say that he wasn't good at it. But, you know, first of all, there's no evidence that my dad wasn't good at real estate, just that there's no evidence that Donald was good at real estate. Uh, so when, when my dad graduated from college, you know, he had his personal and, uh, professional pilot's licenses, but he was still going to trauma management and he was totally dedicated to that idea. Unfortunately, however, my grandfather over the next three years treated him so poorly with such little respect, particularly around people who someday were going to be my dad's employees. He also never delegated any responsibility. So, you know, my dad was, for, and there were, my dad couldn't do anything right, first of all, but he wasn't, he wasn't given any responsibility. So he was bored and my grandfather made his life miserable. He was frustrated and he began to realize that he was, it wasn't going anywhere. So he made the decision then to apply to airlines um, to become a pilot. Uh, Cause after an eight year moratorium, Airlines were hiring again uh, with the uh, introduction of the first jets, the, the 707. He got accepted by TW, TWA on his first try, uh, let my grandfather know, which was probably one of the hardest things my father ever had to do, and then embarked on um, his career with TWA. You get a fast forward. Donald... Um graduates from college and is promoted um, ahead of your ahead of your dad and um, yeah. and it seems like a completely humiliating um, event and I wonder if you can help me understand how your dad felt about that it was the last straw um, I, I don't think he actually ever you know after uh, steeplechase which was the last big development, my grandfather tried to pull off, and it was certainly the last big deal my father was involved in. Um, after it ended badly, and my grandfather blamed my dad for it, which was nonsense, but you know, my grandfather never took responsibility for anything that was bad. Um, you know, it's not like he had any illusions, but the promotion of Donald to president of Trump management when Donald was 24 and my dad uh, had been working there for 11 years, um, I think it gutted him. And he realized that he had no future there, but was still stuck there. 
um, until, you know, he just couldn't do it anymore and he, he left. Um, but uh, he didn't leave to anything. You know, he had some weird, odd jobs and stuff, but he certainly never had a career again. And what do you think it taught Donald? I think it taught Donald that there was nothing he could do wrong, that he deserved everything that was thrown at him. Because it wasn't just the position. Uh, my grandfather just shoveled so much money his way that he didn't earn and that, you know, certainly wasn't available to any of his other siblings. Uh, that there was every reason for Donald to feel like he could do whatever he wanted. It's very similar to what we're, we're living through now, you know, when there are no consequences for your actions, when you're rewarded for um, either doing nothing or failing, of course you're gonna uh, think highly of yourself even, even though it's, um, you know, completely separate from the reality of the situation. I am curious, though, just going back to the church for a moment, were you at Donald and Ivana's wedding? Do you remember that? I do. I, I remember it really clearly because um, for two weeks before that, I'd uh, been down in West Palm Beach visiting my dad, who uh, had moved there a couple of years after he stopped working for my grandfather. Uh, you know, he moved down there to try to start over and pick up the pieces, and unfortunately it didn't work. But, you know, he seemed to be doing okay at the time. Um, but he wasn't invited to the wedding. Uh, so, you know, a lie has been told by them that my dad was supposed to be Donald's best man and master of ceremonies, but he had to stay in Florida to take care of um, my, uh, one of my uncles, um, my grandmother's sister's husband who was ill, but that was a fabrication. So anyway, we went back to New York. Uh, not my dad, my, my brother and I went back to New York, uh, I guess the day before the wedding. And um, I came home to the news that my cat had died. So I, I remember the wedding because I spent the entire time sobbing hysterically because uh, my cat had died. And, uh, you know, it was my first death. Um, and, uh, you know, I was devastated, but um, it was a very weird, uh, that aside, it was a really weird wedding. I, somebody had forgotten to uh, order flowers. Um, and it, the reception was at um, the 21 Club, which I don't know. It seems to me like an odd place to have a wedding reception. It's very clubby and dark. Uh, but it was, you know, very uh, par for the course for my family. What does that mean? <laughs> Just, you know, no real attention to aesthetics or uh, intimacy or, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Do you remember your dad around this time period talking about your uncle, what, what he was sort of seeing, how he processed? He didn't uh, talk about him that much simply, I think, because my my grandfather uh, shoved Donald's success in my dad's face a lot. And um, I think he found that difficult. Um, and I, you know, I don't think my father took Donald very seriously. Um, he certainly never, you know, he never saw him as competition or that they were, you know, fighting over the same resources. He was so much older and also just not that kind of person. But uh, certainly by the time he moved back to New York, uh, which would have been, I guess, a year after Donald and Ivana married, um, he moved back because he had, had open heart surgery when he was 39 and he was very ill. So he moved back into my grandparents' house. And I think by then, um, my dad had just bought in hook, line, and sinker into the family's um, the family's assessment of my father as an alcoholic failure who'd never accomplished anything and uh, their um, line about Donald as this, you know, extraordinary, self-made, um, brilliant businessman. You were just sort of 
talking a little bit about the line that had been developed about Donald. And I wonder if you could just help me also understand sort of the worldview that has been instilled in Donald by Fred around this same time period. By then, um, my grandfather was all in, you know, uh, in the myths that he created about his second son were becoming more and more real to both of them. And, um, you know, because my grandfather knew that he financed Donald, you know, the Grand Hyatt happened and Trump Tower happened because of my grandfather's money, connections, influence, and, um, you know, political donations that he made over the years. He was very, very deeply in uh, the Brooklyn Democratic machine and uh, New York politics, both at the state and local levels. I think in order to survive, Donald had to believe that that myth was true, that, that it was him. It was all him. Um, and it wasn't until, I think, Atlantic City that my grandfather finally understood that maybe, yes, he was financing Donald, but that maybe Donald wasn't so good at anything. <laughs> um, and at that point, you know, Donald's success had always, in my grandfather's view, been a reflection on him. And that's why it was so important to him, you know. It sort of burnished in his own mind his his uh, incredible abilities as a master builder. But when faced with the debacle that was Atlantic City, um, even my grandfather must have started to see that uh, the myth was actually a myth. But he was so tied up in it, he needed to keep perpetuating it, um, which of course allowed Donald to keep believing in it. So uh, it wasn't just Donald blaming outside circumstances, the economy, the banks. It was also my grandfather doing it, even though my grandfather knew better. Do you remember your Uncle Robert or other family sort of talking about this time period? Not really. Um, I know that uh, it was a very interesting dynamic in the family that you didn't, nobody went against my grandfather. So I think whether they actually believed it or not, um, they weren't going to contradict anything. And uh, Donald was always the center of attention. And he was always the most important person in the room. Uh, even though I don't think any of us believe for a second that he was the smartest person in the room. Um, but, you know, as time went on, um, it, it became harder to maintain the sense that he was, you know, the best and this incredibly successful guy. Uh, you know, he and Robert had a falling out. Ro uh, Robert worked for him in Atlantic City for a little bit. And then when things went south, Donald essentially blamed him for his role in it. Uh, so so they had a terrible relationship for a few years after that. And, and you know, um, the more he was in the media and, and the more extravagant and ridiculous his, his spending became and the more bankruptcies he's, he declared, it was really difficult to maintain uh, the, the illusion that my grandfather so desperately wanted to maintain. Let me, um, let me ask you about a scene that's pretty important in this film, which is the Central Park Five case and the ad that, that he places yeah. is that New York you know, time period where um, Rudy Giuliani is running for that first term. And I'm curious to know if you remember um, discussing the ad with, with the family? That was in the late 80s. Um, I was at Tufts University. Um, I, and that, you know, this was back before the internet. So I'm, I don't even know if I was completely aware of it, but I certainly did um, everything in my power to avoid hearing about anything he'd done. Um, you know, I wasn't uh, the, say three or four years after my dad died, nobody in my family reached out to me. I, you know, I saw them at holidays, but we, you know, we weren't in contact. So, um, I just tried to avoid it and it was much easier to avoid back then, obviously. Uh, so when I did hear about it, I mean, it didn't surprise me. Uh, it's completely of a piece with the kind of thing he does now. I mean, in, in the myth and, you know, racial tensions in the city were, um, already at a boiling point and, uh, you know, he's perfectly comfortable, uh, 
putting himself in the middle, as if he had any authority, as if he had any special knowledge that, that gave him uh, the right to say the things he said. Um, and he just, as is his want, made a bad situation worse to benefit him, right? And I think one of the worst things about, uh, you know, I saw a clip recently of, of a press conference he gave. And again, why was it anybody asking his opinion? It's beyond my comprehension. But, you know, just saying the most despicable things about these innocent young men and boys. Help me understand the ethos, the family ethos on race. I mean, where is it coming from? You know, they were just a very racist family. Uh, you know, um, I think part of it was, you know, the time. Um, it wasn't unusual for, I mean, you know, it, it's not like it's unusual now, sadly. But, you know, it was certainly more common and acceptable back then. Um, and I think it was just a que question of, um, you know, we're better than everybody else anyway. And, you know, if you're different from us, you're less than, you know, you're not worth our respect. And um, people of color, you know, African-Americans in particular, uh, Jewish people, women, uh, were all considered um, fair game. Um, and, you know, racism, anti-Semitism and misogyny were very common in my grandparents' house. And it was just the way it was. The house itself, the, the mood when I was reading your book was that this was a, this was a dark place. I mean, that this was not an easy childhood for any of these kids and, and right. you as grandkids. Um, is that right? It wasn't, but again, who knew? <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I'm sure my father knew, but you know, to this day, it, it, it was never really spoken about in those terms. And, uh, you know, my, my grandfather has cast such a shadow that I do believe that towards the end of his life, the only thing that mattered to my dad was, was you know, pleasing his father, which was impossible. Um, you know, my Aunt Marianne said to me a few years ago that uh, at the time she was in her late 70s, and she said, I'm still looking for my father's approval. And, uh, you know, my grandfather remains Donald's audience of one. You know, that's who he's, you know, it's, it's to him Donald's continually trying to prove himself. Yeah, I thought you wrote about this really beautifully in the book that um, he's still searching for that legitimacy, you know, that, that he wasn't right. the adequate replacement to your dad, that, you know, he didn't really fit in as a Manhattan real estate developer or a casino tycoon um, and now is occupant of the, of the Oval Office. Right. That legitimacy is something that he still takes very, very personally. Yeah, because he knows he'll never have it. What do you mean? Well, he's... The difference between his uh, incompetence and the level of competence required to do the job he now has is uh, light years apart, right? Um, he... I think an argument can be made that he didn't actually win the last election. You know, it may be a while before we figure that out if we ever do, but it's certainly, uh, you know, he knows that because he's so hypersensitive about it. But he also knows that there's a really good chance he's incapable of winning the next one because he's doing everything in his power to continue you know, to expand voter suppression, to delegitimize mail-in voting, to make people question whether or not there's even going to be an election or if there is an election, whether we can trust the results of the election. He's done absolutely nothing since 2017 to address the fact that there is continuing to be Russian interference in um, our election system. So why would somebody who isn't worried about legitimacy do all of those things to continue to hold a position of power that he probably shouldn't have had? The, well, he definitely shouldn't have had it. Uh, but, you know, whether or not he got it, got there fair and square, you know, it's uh, he, he's quite transparent in that way.
Is that a little bit of the power of positive thinking of just rewriting? Yeah, I, I think in part it's um, the inability to admit that you've lost or that you didn't measure up in some way or that you needed help. And this is one of the, and in, in, it's an interesting contradiction about Donald. He knows, he knows on some level that he can't win without all of this help. And he's perfectly willing to accept the help, but then will interpret it as a legitimate, overwhelming victory that he accomplished all by himself. You know, it's really interesting. He'll do anything to win um, and then make it, you know, make the case that he won, deserved to win, et cetera. Uh, the power positive thinking part of it is is just that, you know, it's, it's um, how, how do you admit something like that? It, it would, um, it would be negative, you know. Uh, how do you admit that you might lose? How do you admit that um, a lot of people aren't going to vote for you, or a lot of people are, you know, hate you, or or think you're the worst president, so to speak, uh, in the history of this country? You know, it's it, like he can't he can't grapple with that stuff because it threatens it threatens him to the core. Why do you think he wanted to be president? I don't think he did initially. Um, I think it was it was a branding opportunity, and when, it was also a way of getting back at Barack Obama, who had uh, humiliated him at the White House Correspondents' Dinner a couple of years earlier. Um, and it wasn't until uh, you know he realized that um, he might actually get the nomination because the Republican Party handled their primary so poorly that they essentially, without knowing it or meaning to, rigged the entire thing in Donald's favor. Um, and then when he got the nomination and realized he was getting away with everything and that there was this base of people in this country who would support him and, uh, you know, uh, admire him or, uh, you know, have this cult-like devotion to him, the worse he got, right? Plus whatever uh, ways in which it was being communicated to him that there might indeed be um, a hostile foreign power willing to back him up, that I think the idea of winning started to appeal to him, partially because, you know, the presidency could be leveraged uh, to his financial benefit and the benefit of his children, but also because you don't lose. Losing is an unacceptable alternative. What was the family's reaction to his announcement to run? We, it was a joke. We, we didn't take it seriously until, you know, when he got the nomination, still didn't quite take it seriously, but it was very unnerving that he even had a 1% chance of winning, you know, because it should have been a 0% chance. But I, I don't, I honestly don't think anybody took it seriously until afterwards. And um, I don't, you know, didn't really speak to them much about it. I was in too much shock and despair. I've just got one last thing, which is just, you write in the book a decent amount about his penchant for humiliation, you know, and, and we've talked about humiliation, certainly at, at home, but the bullying, the humiliation, things you see in the White House now, things that you see in the administration, the way some of these advisor relationships have imploded. Yeah. Um... I think the thing that most surprises me about the way this has gone isn't his use of humiliation as a weapon, as a tool to um, get people to uh, come to his side of things, you know, because they're just af so afraid of uh, how he's going to treat them or speak of them, but it's how many people are willing to line up who actually think it's going to end up differently for them than it did for the thousands of people who, for whom it didn't work out. Like, that's the part that, you know, that and the number of people willing to enable him. That's pretty shocking. But, um, you know, I think humiliation is, it's a way of controlling people, certainly, but it's also a way of making him feel better about himself. Because if, he, if he's in a position of power, 
where he's the one holding all the cards. Nobody can humiliate him. Um, and if he gets humiliated by circumstances, he's surrounded by people who will protect him from that at all costs. Because it's, it's not going to end well for anybody, uh, you know, who's the messenger in that particular case. Um, but yeah, it's, it's both a, a, a way of, it's a method of self-aggrandizement. It's a method of um, getting pleasure. I think he, he likes it, like my grandfather did. He gets pleasure out of humiliating people. And it makes him feel that he's uh, better than, more powerful than. Thank you, Mary. I was just going to ask if we covered all the strings that you've sort of pulled from. You know, I, I think we have. And, you know, when I, when I started formulating the last section of the book, I thought of the, the five things. He's always been institutionalized. He's always been an illegitimate. He's always been used. He's always been normalized. And he's always been, uh, oh, and he's never been held accountable. So I think on some level, we, we, we did hit all of them, if not directly, then indirectly, because you're really good at this. This is great. 